We got out in the open and decided to take up the conversation on the road north. Paul insisted that he would explain everything once we were safe. And after 20 minutes of driving, I decided we had waited long enough. Well, I think this is a good resting spot. It's getting dark, I suggested as we turned on the roads towards the mountains. The storm was hovering over the forest in front of us, swirling and growling on the horizon. At least a dozen of those demons could be seen with each clap of thunder. We can keep going, Kearney insisted. I sighed, my patience having grown thin. Look, I've tried to wait. I really have. But this is getting old. Enough is enough. Either you tell me the story or I'll just come out and say it, I warned. What is he talking about? Natalie asked. Olivia shared a good long glance at her dad before squeezing his hand and saying, There's no need to hide anything anymore. They've proven themselves more than capable to handle themselves. Paul smiled at his daughter and sighed. The creatures we've encountered so far in this mighty storm, they don't come from out of some hellhole. They come from right here. From people like you and me, Kearney said with a sigh. Natalie shook, the truth hitting her like a ton of bricks. That's what Martin meant, isn't it? He would become part of those things, she said, her voice cracking. The Cunies held a long, guilty gaze to confirm it. Why didn't you tell us? Would it make much difference if I had? You've questioned everything that I've done since you got here, Kearney pointed out. I looked towards the two people in front who were remaining quiet. You knew about this, didn't you? Caleb and Livia didn't make a response. Why would you keep this from us? Natalie said angrily. Because it makes it easier not knowing. To believe that the people you care about are simply gone altogether is a far better fate than what really happens. Olivia spat back. I could hear the frustration and guilt in her voice. I also saw pain and loss. I turned to her father and saw those same feelings in his face as well. Something finally clicked in my head and I realized the secret they had been keeping from all of us. What really happened to Renee? Kearney didn't seem to have the strength to respond, but Livia did. It was supposed to be an ordinary chase. We had been traveling across North Kansas, thinking we had been tracking a storm back to its source. I think we probably drove for six hours, but still couldn't make heads or tails of the area around us. The storm was affecting everything, and even the spatial reality around us. North, south, east, and west simply didn't exist. It was when my mom came up with a theory. It sounds cheesy, but she said that we weren't in Kansas anymore. Olivia paused and looked towards the rolling landscape around us. We had gone inside the storm. Treated us like we were insects trapped inside a spider's web, Paul spat. As if in response, we heard the storm rumble across the sky again. What happened next? Renee came up with a plan to push our way out. It was risky, but we didn't know what else to do. We set up charges near to what we believed were the edge of the storm. We thought if we just heard it, it would let us leave. But instead, the storm pushed back. Hundreds of drones swarmed from the sky, ready to tear us limb from limb. But even when the situation seemed impossible, my mom didn't give up, Olivia added. She sacrificed herself. Found a way to push one last time. We knew that it'd only work one time. We watched as she was taken right in front of our eyes. Couldn't do a thing about it. The storm fell away, but the aftermath lasted a lifetime. My wife was taken from me, changed into one of those beasts against her will, Paul admitted. Caleb had slowed down the van. We were almost at the mountains. I crossed my arms, contemplating everything that the Kearneys had just told us. It was a lot to take in. That's why you've been trying to find this particular storm, isn't it? You think your wife's inside? 
Paul nodded, too exhausted to hide anything else. How can you be sure that she's still alive? I asked. Olivia bit her bottom lip. Every storm has particular patterns. We follow the patterns. But her voice showed a hint of doubt. And that told me all I needed to know. So you don't really know. And you dragged us here to... Do what? To save her? To put her out of her misery. Paul declared solemnly. Even those words seemed to take his daughter by surprise. Years ago, I might have thought differently. They could work some miracle to change what happened. The facts are clearer than ever now. My wife died that day, and the storm took away whatever was left. Since then, all that she has been is a puppet on a string. Her and every other person that this damn thing took from us. Paul said as he took his daughter and tried to comfort her. But Olivia pulled away. Her face told me everything I needed to know. You said you would never give up on her, she said angrily. I haven't. But this is the only way. Only way for her to finally be free, Kiermi declared. Olivia shook her head as Caleb stopped the car. She jumped out, her eyes filled with tears. Natalie wrapped her arms around herself and shivered again. But even despite all of these revelations, I still had my doubts about Paul's plan. You don't stand a chance of destroying this thing. The odds are stacked against us. This is like, like going up against a god. You saw what happened to the camper, to Jim. We nearly all suffered the same fate. Paul shook his head. You hurt the monster already, Dylan. When I heard what you did to that thing, you restored faith in this plan. I know now we can make it. We can blow the nest back to whatever hell it came from. He decided firmly. I couldn't help but to show the same disgust as Olivia. But my reasons were because I had common sense. Even Natalie was getting upset. You still haven't changed since the day we've met. You're so blinded by revenge that you don't care about anyone else. Oh, you put on a good show. But you don't care about what happened to Jim, or to Martin, or to Nick, or any of the other people that have blindly followed you. She screamed. That isn't true, Kearney said in defense. But it was only half-hearted. Her words had cut him to the core. But it was too late. I saw him for the broken man that he was. He would pursue this course to the grave to get his revenge. I need a smoke, I said, stepping out into the open air. It was almost midnight, the only light in the sky coming from the terribly dangerous clouds. Olivia was standing out in the nearby field, staring up at the stars. In the distance, we heard the storm continuing to rumble. She wiped away tears as I joined her. Some team we are, huh? No communication at all. We're no team at all, she laughed. I shrugged and I lit a smoke as she said, You must think that I'm a damn fool for believing that lie for so long. It's not stupid to have hope, I replied, as she passed a cigarette to me. Even false hope? God, how could I have been so stupid? Well, there at the end, before Caleb killed the monster, I saw some part of Jim still inside him, like he was ready to die, and that he didn't want to hurt us. I've seen it before, too. I know these things can still have some bits of humanity in there. She insisted. I looked back towards the camper. Either way, your dad isn't going to stop until we find the nest. What are we going to do once we get there? We have to do everything in our power to save those people trapped inside. Maybe that really does mean destroying it, though, she said with a sigh. I frowned. A crazy idea running through my mind. Maybe we can do both. Olivia tossed the cigarette away. What do you mean? She asked. Well, the nest is like a control tower, right? That's where the primary signal that controls them comes from. So we just have to interpret that broadcast and replace it with our own. Her eyes sparkled with that same spirit I had seen when we first met. 
She was ready to give it a try. We can tell Dad, she declared, just as I was about to return to the van. You think he'll try to stop us? He's had one mission since the day that we lost Mom. Nothing we say will change that, Dylan. We have to keep him thinking we're all in agreement. She looked frustrated that she would have to tell such a lie. But I knew she was right. I know he'll hate me, but if it works and we can save at least some of those poor people, then it has to count for something, doesn't it? Olivia asked desperately. I told her it did. As we moved back to the weather van, we both saw someone standing there near the driver's side door. Caleb. You were listening? I asked. It's my job to watch out for y'all, Mitchum said with a shrug as he stretched his legs. Go tell the old man we'll get back on the road in a tick. I gotta go piss, he added, walking away from the van. Olivia got into the back of the vehicle as I followed Caleb. Coming to watch, Pruitt? He teased. Look. I know we've butted heads before, but if Olivia... If her plan is going to work, we have to work together. I told him evenly. Pretty crazy idea you had there. No, to interrupt the nest signal? He muttered as a gust of wind blew through the nearby tree line. Do you really think it'll work? Mitchum asked as he zipped up his pants. I don't know. Honestly, I'm not sure about any of this anymore, I admitted. Not a good idea to get her hopes up like that if you're 100% sure. You know, just make things worse in the long run, Caleb advised. I haven't heard you offer any words of wisdom. My role here is simple. Keep them safe. I'll do whatever I have to do in order to do that. He paused as he looked me dead in the eyes and growled. And that includes keeping them safe from themselves. I didn't have to ask what the hunter meant. He was prepared to stop the Kearneys if necessary, if their agendas got in the way of their own survival. I couldn't argue with that. I knew it would need to be done if it got that far. Just promise me you'll give us a chance, I insisted. Mitchum nodded and shrugged. Can't talk any of you out of anything anyway, right? He muttered as he got in the back of the driver's seat. Natalie was reviewing the radar, trying to get an idea of how close we were. I think once we get into those woods, we'll be inside the storm, the blonde said, checking her charts again. The forest wasn't registering on the radar at all, just a black hole that sucked in everything around it. The storm was likely holding everything within it as a prisoner, and given what Renee had to go through to break free, I was starting to get nervous about going in. Caleb turned the keys on and we drove towards it. Olivia gave me a weak smile. Paul was focusing on the changing landscape. It was hard to really explain what happened when we entered the storm. One minute we were just staring at the starry sky, and then we were engulfed in total blackness. The forest felt dead. It was still, and not a sound came from anything except our own engine. Everything felt backwards. The air was heavy. My body felt tense, like it was hard to breathe. Our instruments weren't working at all. Shit, this is creepier than I expected, Caleb admitted. We only got about a couple of miles in when the van died. What's wrong? Paul asked. Not sure. Something just killed all the power, Hunter responded. Kearney looked outside the van towards the quiet clearing that we were in. We're nearly there. The nest is close, I'm sure of it. We sat there in the dense forest for another moment, trying to get the nerve to step out. Mitchum was finally the one to decide to make a move and grabbed a few weapons before opening his door. Drones are probably off protecting their hive, he reasoned as he peered out towards the unknown. So deadly quiet, it gave me the chills. Then we heard something shuffling in the brush. Caleb aimed his guns to fire, but only a small squirrel ran across his feet. He laughed nervously. Told you, nothing to worry about, he said with a wink. And then something much larger howled from the forest. Natalie gasped in terror as it reared up behind the hunter. It grabbed a hold of Caleb's upper body and pulled him into the woods. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. If you scroll down to the description at the very bottom, you'll find a whole bunch of people there. Also, we've included this nice little scrolling thing because the number of people who support me on Patreon has gotten so big that I'm afraid it might actually max out 
the description. So we've, we've included this here as the little scrolling text on the end screens. So everybody on that scrolling text, everybody I'm about to mention right now and mispronounce all of your names and everybody who can donate even $1, thank you so much. A very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Reaper61167, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Vicky McQuickie, Sam High, Crusader Chocobo, Spooky Shell, Adam Maros, Grand Moth the Milky, Big Smoke369, Captain Scurvy, Salty Irish Poet, Estebot, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Horror Fan1212, Our Minute Second Time, Kyle Resnack, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Robert Malcolm, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochie Boochie, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Merxenum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Catabaker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Cryolinian, Xavier Graphius, Lord Life's Best, Goring from Magazine, Maria Walker, Emily Mitchell, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Eka Limchok, Dirt Diver O3 Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Hidden Tiger, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Psychomel, Nana, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Cronut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Welverett, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so, so much because you guys help me do everything that I do here. You guys help pay authors for stories and commission stories and do everything that I can do to make this channel and make this podcast the best it could possibly be. So thank you all for supporting me here. And as always, everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>